So Alicia Hamber is an author who is very interesting. She's had a very interesting young life. I have no idea how old she is. It's none of my business, but I do know that she's had one heck of a life, Alicia. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Now, you were born and raised in St. Louis. Yes. But at some point, you were living in the streets? Yes. I've been gone from home since I was 15 years old. Yes. Is it, Did you leave because of abuse? Yes, I did. And... But you still went to school. I went to school. Mm -hmm. I uh, Sometimes in the same clothes for two or three days in a row. But I, I went to school as long as I could until I got pregnant and had my son uh, born out of prostitution. Uh, and just had to do what I had to do to take care of him. So I was not able to actually finish school. So in, in this life, oh my God, you were what, 15, 16 years old? Yes. Yes. I mean, and you were prostituting to, to, to take to, 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 so you could survive. Yes, pretty much. It, it's so street life. Did you ever think you'd get out of that life? I didn't. I, I thought the only way out of that life for me was going to be somebody was going to kill me. I used to actually pray that when I would walk out of the door, I used to have my son sleeping in a dresser drawer. And I would leave out of the hotel room and leave my son behind in the dresser drawer so he'd be safe. And a lot of times I would just hope that somebody would just kill me and that I just would never come back. Wow, man. It's, it's, it, it was just that heartbreaking. So what was the turning point? The turning point for me was I ended up um, getting married to a military soldier mm -hmm. and ended up traveling. Now, I didn't get married because I was in love. I got married out of need. I wanted to get away from where I was and try to get somewhere stable for my son. But honestly, the turning point for me was prison. Uh, seven years in federal prison for assault. and uh, Seven years for assault? Who did, who, what, what did you do? <laughs> what, did, what, did you shank somebody? Well, I mean, what did you... What, seven years for assault? That's a long time for assault. It, it is when you do it on military property. Uh, yeah, not good. Yeah. So, um, actually, it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me, though. Because up until that point, I was carrying around everything that I had gone through. There's no way I can condense it into 10 minutes. So mm -hmm. it's like, it just, I was carrying it around so long, so long. And it's like, um, I had tried to kill myself in the county jail. I tried to hang myself from the bars because I was just like, I can't do this anymore. What is it about me that I have to keep going through this? And it's like, when that failed and I couldn't get the knot to stay around my neck, is the first time I had cried in like so, so many years. It's like the first time I was defeated is what it was. I felt like I couldn't even do that right. I couldn't even take myself away from the pain right. And I felt totally defeated. And that's when I began to cry. And when I started to cry, I didn't stop crying. But it was good because at that time, my heart was fertile for God to move in and say, okay, now, now I, I can get a hold of you. Now I can show you what I need to show you because right now you're about as fertile as they come. You have no way to go but up. Right. So it, it, it was people look at me crazy when I say it's the best thing that ever happened to me, but it was. Now, so while in prison is when you found out about writing, you were encouraged to write by inmates? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to, uh, we would have these plays. And I could just come up with an idea off the top of my head. And nine times out of ten, it dealt with some type of abuse because that was all I knew. So but it was wonderful because so many women in prison have been through that and don't speak about it. Don't mm -hmm. say anything about it. So it kind of captivated them and they would just dare me to write a book. I dare to see if you could do it. And I just did it to see if I could. Yeah. Here we are. We're nine books later. And I did it. Now, you've got nine books. Yeah. Uh, now, all these books that tell the story about uh, these stories that you that you write about are from life experiences. They are. A lot of them. Don't get me wrong. You have to turn into an author. Oh, I understand. Like, <laughs> I understand that. I, I get that. I get that. Yeah. But they're but they're all based in truth, though. They're all based in facts. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you might have stretched it a little bit to make it. You know, I, I get that part. But it all started from something that happened to you. Yes. Yes, uh, unlovable. Can't say that other word, but unlovable. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> unlovable is like the first six chapters are my childhood. Um, nine years old, a grown man, pretty much um, 
seeking out the weakest link in the house. I was the youngest girl. So he sought out the weakest link. And it was just like bringing you candy and presents to where you thought you were special. And then turned around and this grown man started touching you in places that and, and you're so confused by it because wait he's saying he loved me he's bringing me all these things but what he's doing is feeling bad but he's saying there's nothing wrong with it this is how it's supposed to be and it just was um took me so long to write that because it hurt mm -hmm. so bad but once i got past um i knew it was time and, and I know it was time because there's so many people that's been blessed by it. So many people who won't speak up to this day. Mm -hmm. So many parents who will say that kid is crazy. That never happened in my house and da, 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 da. And that keeps a lot of women from saying, I don't want to bring up this kind of stuff about our family. So I'm not going to talk about it. I'll just keep it to myself. But they don't realize the more you keep it to yourself it's the more you're you're still in bondage. You're still in prison. I was in prison more out here on those streets being a prostitute and all of that than I ever was inside those walls. Because inside those walls, I were able to finally release that. Mm -hmm. Out here, I was hanging on to it and it, affect, it affected every part of my life. Decision-making skills, the way I treated my kids, relationships, the whole night. And so your children, Alicia, they, they know all about your past. They they know the, the, the they know the grimy part and everything. I hide nothing from them because the world is not gonna hide anything from them. And especially my son, who's actually born out of prostitution, I wanted him to know that I loved you enough that regardless of what I had to go through, I was gonna keep you and we were gonna make it. And it's like that he has a difficult time in life because he's angry as well. He watched me go through a lot of things. And as a young boy growing up, I can understand he felt like he couldn't help me and he couldn't protect me. So he has a lot of anger in him too. And I try to talk to him about it, but I don't sugarcoat anything with my children, my nieces, any young girls that cross my path, because most people that's been abused, he didn't gift wrap his private parts before he molested you. Right. It was raw, it mm -hmm. was uncut, it was grimy. And so the only way I can get them to know that I know what you've been through is to tell it like it was. So are you close to your family that, you know, who, who I'm not gonna say allowed this to happen to you, but I, I, I don't know the backstory on that, but are you close to them at all? I'm not as close as I would like to be. Mm -hmm. um, I've come to find a lot of things that went on behind those walls that I didn't even know was going on with others in my household. But I will say this, um, for a long time, I held a lot of them accountable because I was the baby girl. Mm -hmm. And as I've grown now, I have to understand, even as far as my mother is concerned, as a 33, 34 year old woman with five children and my husband dies on me and, and, I don't know how I would have handled that. I don't. As my sisters who were also growing up in the puberty and dealing with other things that I didn't know they were dealing with, I can't hold anybody accountable for it but the person who did it. So, yes, nobody wants their dirty laundry to come out. But it's not about embarrassing them. It's about healing me and it's about helping other people heal as well. Have you ever confronted the uh, person who molested you? You know what, Tony, let me tell you something funny. I saw him on the bus one day and he sat there and I will never forget his face. He looks just like Smokey Robinson. Turn Smokey Robinson off every time I see him on TV because he looks just like him. OK, but I saw him on the bus one day and he sat down next to me and he asked me for change for a dollar. He had no idea who I was because I haven't seen him since I was nine. Mm -hmm. So but I could never forget him. And as bad as there's a part of me that wanted to just jump them and beat them and stab them and just every, I froze up. Out of fear, out of... I found myself like that nine-year-old girl. Uh -huh. Once again, it just like froze. Everything in me, every piece of growth and everything in me just retreated and I felt just frozen. And it's like, um, how does that person still have that much power over you? Well, it's easy to say they don't when you never see that person. But just at that moment caught off guard, it just really something I could have never, ever prepared myself for. I haven't seen him since. So <laughs> do, do you think in your mind, if you were to see him again, you, you would react? I'm not saying you would just hop on and start beating and stabbing him. But do you think <laughs> you would you would do anything else besides freeze up or do you not know? 
You know what? I think this time I would honestly be strong enough to talk to him. I think honestly, um, when you sit back and you think about the mothers who go to the prisons to meet their sons, killers and things like that. I think I don't know if I'm necessarily at that point, but I think I'm at the point where I can sit and say, you know, you destroyed my life, but I've got it back now. Right. You know, you, you, you did something that took a lot of years away from me, but I've got it back now. And I honestly probably could I, don't make me say I say I forgive you because mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm at that point yet until I actually stand in front of him. I could try and say I'll say it, but I don't know. Do you do, do you think it's even possible for you to forgive him? I. It's so easy to say I do. But, Tony, my nightmare still comes sometimes. Mm-hmm. And if I'm laying next to my significant other, you know, men, they want to roll over, touch their women in the middle of the night, hanky panky. Mm-hmm. You can't do that to me because if I'm asleep, naturally, my mind flashes back to a time when those were hands at my bedside at nighttime that weren't supposed to be there. Right. And if you touch me, I automatically jump and get defensive. And that's hurtful. That's mm-hmm. hard for a man to deal with because a man's like, what is going on with you? And right. you're just like, just don't do that. Mm-hmm. So those some of those aftershocks stay with you forever. And there are some things you can't get rid of no matter how much therapy you've had. No matter It's, it's there because it's in your memory. Right. So I live with it and it doesn't control my life anymore. But I live through it now. OK. Alicia Hamber is a St. Louis author. She has, what, nine books? Eight books. Uh, well, number nine is being on this table written, so we're going to call that and claim that. Okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> now, now, what, now, what's your latest published book? It'll be Unlovable Part 3. I won't say that word again, okay. which is actually the first Unlovable was my childhood. And then after Chapter 8, I had to turn into an author. So I had to create other characters and make this girl go through. Now, some of these things she still go through, I did go through. But you they always tell you as an author, you can't write what you don't know. Right. It's impossible because real readers will pick it apart like that. Mm-hmm. So I'm on part three now. And part three, uh, part one and part two are actually ones that Tyler Perry read. So I'm on part number three. Okay. And I'm going to get that to him as soon as possible. <laughs> okay. So you have, you have, I'm not saying you have a, a, like a, a business relationship with you, but he knows that Alicia, ha- Alicia Hammer is on his radar. That's right. Wow. I'm right wow. on. Now, flying high. now, how did that happen? <laughs> um, there was, uh, his assistant is a friend of a friend of mine who at the time they were down in, de- in Texas uh, about to do a stage play. And they were looking for a new talent, and and he introduced the book to the assistant, and she in turn passed it along to Mr. Perry, part wow. one and two. And I mean, that just was wow, totally, totally awesome for me. And it's like if you, I don't know, Tony, I just know that there's a destiny out there for me. Mm-hmm. You don't go through everything you go through just to be able to say I'm still standing. Right. You go through it. It would be selfish of me to say I made it through it, so I'm cool now. No, I. It is my dream just to try to get as many, many, many girls, even boys nowadays, because they're being molested too. Mm-hmm. But you, as well as older people, we're all just living. Oh God, we're not free. We're not. Mm-hmm. We're living, but we're not living free. Will so, Will you ever live free? I don't know, Tony. It's, you it, know what? I'm scared that I'll never find that person that's going to love me for who I am, who I've been, and the potential of who I can be. Because it's easy to love me now. I'm, I'm, I've am i made it. I'm standing on my feet now. Mm-hmm. But can you love me when we're standing in the quick trip and somebody recognizes me from a life that I had no choice to live? Can you still stand beside me and say, hey, we passed that. We're not worried about that. Or, or are you going to do the typical, oh, my God, she's been around and this, this, and this. But And yes, I have. But mm-hmm. guess what? I'm blessed. I'm, I'm blessed to be standing with my bright mind, my good health. And if he's out there, I know God's going to send him to me. Well, then why not, having said that, why not just move to Dallas or, or, or Louisville or Miami or somewhere and, and with a fresh start? Why, why not that? 
It's like Daniel in the lion's den, Tony. I got to come back here. This is where it all began for me. But there's so much pain here. It is. It is. And to conquer that pain means I have reached the milestone God wanted me to reach. It means I can walk around here with my head high because my past doesn't define who I am anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm, I'm not going to let it stop me from going where I'm going. But also, this is fertile ground. This is very fertile ground. How can I go bless another city and not bless my own? And I, 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 I cannot do that. Okay. No, I respect that. I respect that. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, uh, you got you to gotta, you gotta walk your own path. Yeah. So, so the, the latest book is, again, tell me the name of it again. Unlovable Part Un, 3. Okay, Unlovable Part 3. And is this the one that's on the desk now, or this one already published? No, this one's on the desk. I'm okay. almost done with this one. Okay, so you're almost done with Unlovable Part 3. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about the one that people can actually buy, the latest one. Ooh, uh, this one, she's actually, she's been arrested for murder. And for those who've already read Part 1 and 2, they know what I'm saying. She no, actually, no, 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 don't tell me about Part 3 that's not published yet. Tell okay, me about the, 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 the latest book that is published. Ah, the latest book that is published would be Mimica Avenue 2. Okay. And for those who's on the Walnut Court area of St. Louis, they know Mimica, Mimica. Avenue very well. Right, right. <laughs> but that's also a part of me in my relationship mode. Put it that way. It's like hood love. It's a girl who wants to be loved so bad she's willing to do anything for a man just to keep him close to her. When it turns out that, I mean, she knew he wasn't worth it, but she's just on that. In, in order not to be alone, I, I have to do whatever I have to do as far as drugs, anything just to say for the sake of saying I want to be loved. And we as women do that all the time. Mm -hmm. We'll put up with a man that we have. We know is no good for us, but I don't want to be alone. I just want to be loved. Even if that love is not pure, it isn't real. I just I just want to feel like I'm loved. And that's what Mimica Part 2 is that's about. That's Part 2 is about. Yes, it's wow. a doozy. Man, man. <laughs> so let me ask you this. Uh, uh, growing up, did you ever see a loving man-woman relationship? Um. Well, first of all, my father died when I was seven. Okay. But before my father died, um, I, could, I have memories of my mother that are so different as far as being a woman with a man in her life. She, um, as far as cooking, sewing, creating things and, and all that type of stuff. And I mean, my aunties and uncles, they're all still married to each other, never got divorced. And I mean, as far as even though I saw that outside of my home, uh, inside my home was like there were no hugs. There were no you did a good job. There was no, I'm so proud of you, or you're very smart, or it was always everything negative. Mm -hmm. You're stupid, you're dumb, oh, you're this. Man. And those things start to sit down in you. And whenever you try to think you can do something, they come right back at you and let you know that I can't. Because if someone who's supposed to love me says those things to me, it must be true. And mind you, like I said, now that I'm older, Tony, mm -hmm. um, I've said some things to my kids the same exact way. I could look at them and just say, I, oh, you're so stupid. And then I would automatically get mad at myself. Did you and apologize? I didn't know how. This is pre-prison, put okay. it that way. Okay. I didn't know how to apologize to them. I didn't know how to say, you're not stupid, but that just wasn't a very smart thing you did. I didn't mm -hmm. know how to separate that. Mm -hmm. I would find myself saying the exact thing, same things to them that she said to me. And then I would get mad at myself because I'm like, I sound just like her and I can't stand her. And then I turn around and say, oh, I'm going to be just like her. So I hate myself. And it just was so much going on. And now I can sit back and I can say, you know what? I'm, I, I'm so proud of you. I love you. But I had to learn that, Tony, because I, I didn't learn it coming up wow yeah you have an interesting catalog of published works that everybody needs to take time and whichever one or all of them uh you can uh, you should check out because you, you're the the stories that these are based your life has been very interesting uh it, it, painful i'm sure mm -hmm. and to some degree the pain is still there that's pretty obvious because you know but but you're you're dealing with it and you're fighting your way through it 
And I know the light, the light is already being shown at the end of the tunnel. And I know you're still coming out and it's a work, it's a, you're, you're a work in progress, as some people would say. Yes, I am. Yes, wow. I am. I am God's butterfly. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the tattoo artist, he said, why do you want God's butterfly? I said, because I've been preserved in his cocoon for mm-hmm. a time such as this until I could get my own wings and fly on my own. Okay. Meaning it's like no matter what I've gone through in life. I have moments where I miss my family. I miss them to I miss my mother to death, Tony. I miss my mother. You know what I mean? I miss being able to pick up the phone and say, hi, mom. Mm-hmm. I miss you. Or I'm having a bad day. Mom, can you help me? But I don't have that kind of relationship with my mother. I don't really have it with my siblings either. And that's a heartfelt thing that I miss so much because all I've ever wanted to do was be a part of that. I just didn't know how because of everything I went through, I thought, set me apart from them. Okay. And and it's like to be able to go to them and say, I've needed you guys all this time. Um, it's hurtful. Mm-hmm. It is. But at the same time, God put other people in your life to keep you pushing forward. And whatever way they can be a part of my life, I accept that. I accept it. It's hurtful, but I accept it. And I'd rather have them smidge it mm-hmm. than not at all. So it, it is what it is. Alicia Hamber is uh, her books are available on Amazon. Yes, they are. And uh, pick up one, and uh, some of them are even available for the Kindle, so you can yeah. uh, do that. So it and was, the Nook and the Nook and, and Barnes and Noble. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, and it's very good to talk to you. It's very good to finally see you. <laughs> <laughs> That is Alicia Hamber. We'll put uh, links to her books in the show notes down below. Alicia, thanks so much. Thank you, Tony. Nice to meet you.